All right, so welcome to Operations Research. This is lecture N minus 1, where N is, I think, 18, maybe 19, something like that. So what we're doing today is we're doing linearization. So the idea is we have the simplex method. We haven't analyzed in great detail as to why it runs as quickly as it does, but we have some rough idea as to why this is a good thing. The question is, how expansive is linear programming? How many different types of problems can you solve? Well, it is a huge restraint that everything has to be linear. It turns out that you can relax this a little bit. One place you can relax it is in the objective function. If the objective function is quadratic, it's not so bad. Unfortunately, if the constraints are quadratic, that is beyond what we can do. In fact, Quadratic constraints are essentially the same as binary integer programming. So we have not talked about why binary integer programming is as difficult as it is. It seems reasonable that it should be difficult. We have to move in a discrete set. We don't have the ability of moving continuously. Uh, I can briefly show you right now, if you could do quadratic constraints, how you could do integer programming. Consider the following quadratic constraint. So if I give you the constraint x times 1 minus x equals 0, what can you tell me about that constraint? x is 0, 1. X is zero, one. We've now encoded x as an integer variable. In fact, it's a binary integer variable. If we could just put in a constraint like this, we could now do integer programming. Because if we can do binary, we can do anything. And if instead of doing quadratics, if you could do cubics, you could allow x to be one, two, th you know, 0, 1, 2, stuff like that. So this shows you uh, what you would be able to do if you could expand your constraints a little bit. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to linearize nonlinear functions. There's a whole slew of things that we're going to do. So linearization. We can do things like or, XOR. So what does XOR? How do you pronounce this actually? Is that how you pronounce it? XOR? Either one. What's that? So this is the one that's only a certain thing. Right. So it's the exclusive OR. When I was a freshman at Yale, there was a misunderstanding between myself and the Spanish department, and they didn't give me credit for a class I took in past. And I found out two weeks into the spring semester, I was now on bad academic standing and had to quickly add some new classes to my schedule. So I added a logic theory class because I figured that's not going to be that challenging. 50% of the exam was you were given 10 questions, and they were like, you know, P and Q implies not P or not Q, if and only if, P and Q, something like that. And the instruction said, state which of the following are true or false. And what I wanted to write is, all 10 sentences are truth value determinable, they are all true or false. And this was a logic theory class. The teacher used the inclusive or rather than the exclusive or. I asked her what she would have done if I had done that. She laughed and said, I would have given you an F. I don't think, of, I don't think a logic professor could have done that, but as a freshman, I was not going to risk it, you know, especially when they were all much easier than when I just told you. There's a difference between or and exclusive or. In an or, if both A and B are true, then A or B is true. With the exclusive or, it's A is true or B is true, but not both. Another one we want to do is we want to have and. We want to have max. We want to have min. We want to have absolute value. Uh, truncate. Lots of functions like this. Okay? And we're going to see how to do these through linear programming. What I will probably do is I'll only do a couple of them on the board. And then once we do a few, you'll get a sense of how to do the others. The full details are in the book. It's not that illuminating to just keep going through them all again and again and again. Whenever you have a linear programming environment, you never want to be at the point where you are coding these by brute force. You want to have a good program that will allow you to just write at a high level language and it will code it properly for you. Okay? Why is the absolute value function so nasty in calculus? It's not differentiable. And so as soon as you have the absolute value function, you lose the ability to apply calculus. You can't take the derivative. It's said the most cited work 
of mine, at least according to research gate and various other websites, is a series of notes I wrote when I was at Brown on the method of least squares. And the method of least squares, how many of you are st stats people? Okay. Method of least squares is you know, one of the two main tools. Uh, a lot of other people use maximum likelihood to try to find best fit values for various things. And we have lots of different ways of looking at errors. We can look at predicted minus observed. What's bad about looking at predicted minus observed for error? I'm sorry? Well, there's no absolute value here. I'm saying I could just use predicted minus observed. Yeah. Yeah. If I want to find the best fit line through these two points, that would actually have zero total error. So this is bad. We could then look at the absolute value of predicted minus observed. This is better now because now errors will sum, but it's not differentiable. You can't use the tools of calculus. If we do predicted minus observed squared for our error, now we can use the tools of calculus because this is a differentiable function. The problem is now all errors are not weighted equally. You know, one error of two is much worse than two errors of one. I like to say, if I'm the one who is doing the analysis, I want to use the squares. If I'm paying for the analysis, I want absolute values. Okay? So it is a huge deal choosing the right function to work with. You want functions that will be illuminating and useful. How many of you have ever read anything by Richard Feynman? Wonderful, wonderful character. Nobel laureate in physics. Uh, he has reduced all of physics to one equation. Does anybody know this one equation that describes all of physics? So here's physics. So u equals zero. And what you is, is you take every physical law and you subtract the left-hand side from the right-hand side and square it and then add. And then the only way a sum of squares will be zero is if each individual term is zero. So he gives this as a great example of just because you can make something compact doesn't mean it's useful. You know, our goal is to have something where we can do an analysis. And we have to constantly be thinking, is what we're doing, is it just algebraic gymnastics, just rewriting things, or is it actually putting it in a position where we can do something with it? Writing u equals zero does not help us solve physics. It allows us to save chalk. Okay, so what we're going to be doing here when we're trying to find ways to linearize, we don't want to just make them linear. We want to make them linear in such a way that we can actually do something with it, that we can apply techniques. Okay? So we've got to be a little bit careful. You know, the simplex method is assuming we have the ability to do continuous movement. Right? We were looking at these basic feasible. We assumed we had maybe a solution with the minimal number of non-zero entries. And then we got a new solution by trading a column out. And then we said, let's continuously vary. And we know it's a, still a basic feasible solution when our parameter is zero. So it'll still be a basic feasible solution for some small window. Or maybe it'll become a feasible solution because we'll have too many components. But there'll be a small window where everything will be OK, that everything is still going to be positive. And then when we go sufficiently far, we will have a first occurrence where something vanishes. That completely breaks down if we're doing everything discrete. So the method we were using before will not work here. And we need to use more advanced techniques. We need to use other techniques to handle integer programming. So it's worth being aware of the difficulties and the challenges. OK. So let's do um, so binary integer variables. So we've done these before. So basically, x will be in 0 or 1. It's either on or off. It happens, it doesn't happen. Okay. Think of it as, as we did, the movie is showing on a given screen and starting at a given time. The plane takes off. American Airlines calls me with their latest cancellation. You know, maybe that will be my binary variable for them. Okay. But you could use it for a lot of things. You know, I love using binary variables to indicate when something has happened. Right. So I'm going to make a couple of assumptions about all the stuff we're looking at. So the first assumption is 
any quantity a in the problem is bounded by n, i.e., the absolute value of a is less than or equal to n. So no matter what I'm looking at, it can't go above a certain amount. Is this a reasonable assumption? There's only finitely many particles in the universe, right? I could have astronomically large bounds. My bound might be 10 to the quadrillion. So it's very convenient. So this does mean that if I'm trying to model, say, a baseball game, my team will not be able to score more than 10 to the quadrillion runs. I can live with that. Okay. The second one is a discreteness assumption. Um, all quantities are discrete and multiples of some delta. All right. So that one seems a little bit more severe. So imagine you are, uh, let's do apple. I haven't done apple yet. Is it reasonable to assume that all of your revenues are discrete multiples of some delta? What would you choose delta to be? Penny? Uh, I, I actually think it would matter for Apple because that means when you're selling your products, you would not be able to sell anything for less than $1,000 unless you sell it for $0. Now, in a few years, maybe sure, but I think $1,000 is a little excessive for Apple. Yes? Well, I'm just saying every quantity is an integral multiple of some number delta. Delta could be a real number. It could be a rational number. Well, actually, ha well, real number would include rational number. So my question is, what do you think we should take delta if, to be if we're looking at something like Apple? So I've had two suggestions, $1,000, which I think was withdrawn. I'm sorry? 250 I'm sorry? Well, we've, we've got, we've got what, did you say one cent? So we have one cent, which so far is the best I've heard. There may be something better than a cent, though. Anybody ever buy gas for a car? If not, you're welcome to fill up my tank later today. Maybe a tenth of a cent. Anybody see Superman 3 or Office Space? Where they're trying to steal those fractions of a cent that are floating out there? So you might want to choose maybe delta is one one hundredth or one one thousandth of a cent. Okay? And it's not going to make a huge difference you know, when you're that far down, but that might be enough so that you're no longer worrying. If you look at really big deals, I would not be surprised if when you are working with your suppliers, you might actually have prices that go down to you know, a tenth of a cent, you know, if you're buying a sufficiently large quantity of them. Right? So my hope is that you will agree that these are reasonable assumptions, and that you know, for the problems we're looking at, it really isn't that bad. Let's say we're doing the traveling salesman problem. This would be saying then that the distance between Boston and Los Angeles you would have to be some multiple of delta. And your know, delta might be one hundredth of an inch. I'm quite fine saying I'm going to round all distances to within one one hundredth of an inch. And that's going to be a good enough formulation of the problem for what we want to do. So it's always worth really thinking about how severe are these assumptions. Can you really notice the difference at one one hundredth of an inch? Uh, since we mentioned Richard Feynman earlier today, one of his quotes is, quantum mechanics is so accurate that the number of decimal digits of accuracy we have in a lot of problems is equivalent to measuring the distance between Los Angeles and Boston to within the thickness of a human hair. These are damn accurate measurements. All right, just make delta a little bit smaller. Right. There's some natural scale for a lot of this. All right, now what we want to do is uh, we want, which is the first one I want to do. 
So I want uh, Z A to equal one if let's see which way do I want to do this? If some quantity A is greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. Okay. So in some sense, this is an indicator variable. It's going to tell me if ZA is positive or negative. Let's try to think of an example where I might want something like this. Maybe this is the number of people that are coming into the movie. And if it's positive, I want to get ticket revenue from them. If it's negative, I don't want to you be in the position where I'm now losing revenue for people not coming in. Okay. Good. Uh, you don't see positive. Right. Excellent. So one suggestion was for the Queen's problem, ZA could be how many pieces are attacking your square. And all you care about is the positive. Uh, now over here, I'm doing it greater than or equal to zero. You can, of course, do it greater than or equal to one. Right. So there's lots of situations where you might want something like this. And we want to just detect, is this quantity positive or negative? Uh, did I tell you about my friend and the 19% credit card offer? So you know credit card companies, uh, maybe it was in probability? It was the talk. Oh, it was the Moolah talk, okay. So everybody knows that credit card companies are wonderful corporations. We all love them and they have nothing but our best intentions at heart, right? And the 19% interest rate they charge is for our own good. Many, many years ago, one of my friends overpaid his credit card statement and the credit card company did not have a program that detected sign. And so it noticed that the balance in his credit card account was not zero. But because he overpaid, the bank actually gave him 19% interest. <laughs> my friend and I diverge on a couple of things. I would have paid off my next couple of bills he called the bank. I know, theoreticians. Okay, so... <laughs> We want to code something like this. So we want to introduce some variables. So we can do this by introducing just one variable. Okay? The variable, not surprisingly, will be ZA, which is in 0, 1. So this is going to be our binary variable. And now we want constraints. So I somehow want a constraint or maybe a couple of constraints that will force ZA to take on a given value if A is positive, and I will want it to be zero if A is negative. So we know negative N less than or equal to A less than or equal to N, and we know A is a multiple of delta. Right? So I want delta over, yeah. So consider the following two constraints. So the first thing is, can we find anything that will force ZA to be 1 if A is positive? Well, let's not worry about what will happen if A is negative. Can we think of anything that will force ZA to be positive? Divide by itself. Divide by what? ZA divided by ZA? Yeah. What are we dividing? So say clearly. A over A. A over A. Well, A over A is just 1. Right. I, I want a constraint that's going to force ZA. I want a relation. I want something involving ZA, A, and, and delta. And I want this to force ZA to be 1 if A is greater than or equal to 0. That's what I want. I want some relationship among these quantities ZA, A, and in delta. And I want it to be linear in ZA and A. So think of A as some kind of quantity derived from other variables that we're looking at. So A is a linear combination of variables that we already have. ZA is a new variable. This needs to be linear in, Z, in these two. 
and over here it can be whatever. Well, because n and delta are parameters. They don't, it doesn't have to be linear in those two. We don't have them yet, right? The whole idea is we're building them up. Um, how many of you have ever taken the derivative, I guess I'll call this an aside, of 1701x to the 24601? Anybody ever take the derivative of this function? Okay. Is it a challenge to take the derivative of this function? Now you have a general framework now. You have the rule for derivatives. You have the power rule. You have the constant rule. You can apply them together and get that. This is why we spend time in calculus building up all these results. It then gets it to the point where we can then handle a new thing like this immediately. The idea is we want to build up these functions. And so we're building them up. Right. We're building. Yes. Yes. So we're starting from scratch. Yes. Okay. So I want some kind of relationship like this, which will force z a to be 1 if a is greater than or equal to 0. And then if a is negative, it's not going to give me anything useful. That's fine. What do you think constraint 2 is going to do? What do you think we want constraint 2 to do? A equals 0. Yeah. So we'll have some new function g of z a, a, and, and delta, which will force z a to be 0 if a is greater than or equal to, I'm sorry, if a is less than 0. Right. And then over here, we would want to say, if a is less than 0, says nothing. And here would be, if a is greater than or equal to 0, says nothing. Because I, I, I don't want this to screw up that one or this to screw up that one. Right? So if a is greater than or equal to 0, this one kicks in. And if a is less than 0, then this gives us no restriction on zA. And if, Z a, and if a is less than 0, this one kicks in and forces z to be 0. But if a is greater than or equal to 0, it does nothing. It has no constraint on zA so that this one would be the decider. All right, so are, we, are we all clear on what we want to do? All right, so in the interest of space, um, so minus a over delta okay, so what do you want to try to do? Like n minus a. Nah, it's not moving. All right, yeah, this is the trouble going to the last board. All right, what do we want to try to do? Right. So we know A's multiples of delta. Right. Can I can I erase the stuff over here, or do, do you want me to keep the stuff as to what our goal is? Erase, not erase. Did anybody say keep? Do you mind being outvoted, or do you feel strongly? All right. So let's try to think about what's going on. So we have some quantity A. We know the largest it can be is N. What if I look at A divided by N? What's the largest this could be? Largest that could be is 1. And again, I'm not saying that this is working. I'm, I'm just throwing things down. I actually have the solution in front of me if I get stuck. I have not prepared this lecture. Wonderful advantage of a five-hour school committee meeting yesterday. But let's try to think, what if we look at something like a over n? Can we do integer, uh, like, are, are we allowed to do integer division? It could be like a plus n minus 1. Like we, we can do stuff like that. Just do like modular remainder. That we can't do modular remainders. So if I look at this quantity, this quantity is a positive number. if um, a is negative, and it's a negative number if a is positive. So now I want to do something linear. 
So let's look at ZA, and there should be some constant in front of ZA. What's the easiest constant to have in front of ZA? One. So let's look at something like this. If A is negative, then this whole thing is positive, and this expression is always going to be positive, no matter what ZA is. If A is positive, then this part here would be negative. And then the only way this expression would be positive would then be as if ZA is positive itself. So I could shift things a little bit. I could look at maybe A plus one-half delta. So let's try something like this. Let's see what this would do. If A is negative, then A has to be at least negative delta. So this expression would be at least negative a half delta. This would then be a small positive number. No matter what ZA is, this would be positive. So, this, so if A is less than 0, then ZA can be either 0 or 1. What if A is 0 or larger? Well, if A is 0 or larger, this expression is positive. What's the only way this expression could then be greater than or equal to 0? ZA has to be 1. So if A is greater than or equal to 0, ZA equals 1. So this condition does what we want. This is a really nice condition. If A is less than 0, ZA is completely free. If A is greater than or equal to 0, it forces ZA to be 1. Yes? But if you use a greater than or equal sign there, why can't you say if A is greater than or equal to 0, you yeah. means Z is 1? But, then you, but that's an if statement. We don't have an if statement, right? We don't know if. Any Roger Whitaker fans? Oh, right. Uh, you can look up his song about if. So we do not have if statements yet. We are building up to the point where we will have an if statement. And in some sense, this is basically giving us if A is greater than or equal to 0, then ZA equals 1, else ZA equals 0. This is basically giving us an if-then-else. That's what we're building. So building and if, then, else. That's one way of looking at what we're doing. Right now, what we're doing is something a little bit more basic. We're just building an indicator function. It's going to be 1 if A is greater than or equal to 0, and it will be 0 otherwise. If you want, I could build, a, I could build an indicator function for it to be greater than or equal to 0, and I could build an indicator function for it to be greater than or equal to 1. And if those two things are equal, then it means it has to be exactly equal to 0. So I can easily go from a greater than or equal to zero to an exactly equal to a specific number. So you know, the ability to do something like this is extremely powerful. Now, we have to have linear constraints. We can have inequalities. We've already learned in linear programming how to deal with inequalities and make them equalities. So I'm not worried about that. This is a linear constraint. So now we have to look at the next part. So we're going to have some relationship with A and some relationship with Z. And now we want it so that if A is negative, we want Z to be 0. Um, just a question on number 1. Yes. Could we do like A over A plus 1 half delta? So A over... Like A over A plus you, 1 half delta? And then like you can't have A over A plus 1 half delta because remember A is a function of other variables in the problem. It has to be linear in A. So if only somebody in the class had fought me to say we should keep that stuff on the board where it said that you know, it has to be linear in Z, A, and A. You can email me for extra credit because you were the only one to want that. All right. It's got to be linear in Z, A, and A. It doesn't have to be linear in delta and N. And in fact, we have an N down below. So this is the first constraint. So I realize we have spent an inordinate amount of time on one constraint, right? But this is you know, going to pay huge dividends. 
Once we can do a couple of these, you can then generate a whole slew of them. I think it's really worth taking the time of trying to see how would you guess something like this. I could easily just write down the constraints, but I want to try to think about how we might get there. We need another constraint, and we want this to be if a is less than 0, we want za to be forced to be 0. And if a is greater than or equal to 0, then za is in 0, 1. Right? That's what we want to happen. So we need some kind of relationship. And now again, we can throw in n's and deltas. We have lots of choices for stuff like that. So the way I wrote it, um, what second term? So how, what, how do you want to write it? So a plus one half delta over n. Let's check. If a is negative, then this is going to be a negative number. So maybe we would want this. All right, so let's say we try this less than equal to zero. If a is negative, then the only way this whole thing would be negative is if za is zero. But now what would happen if a is positive? Is there any way this could become? So we, we, we could try to fix this. Well, what if we then maybe did negative 2n? Well, I, I guess the most this could be is a little, we'll do it like this. Um, you know, maybe, so right, uh, we've got to just be a little bit careful because if a is equal to n times delta, this whole thing would be a little bit more than 1. Right. So, you know, to be safe, you know, something like 2, you know, I might have to bump it up a little bit. So let's try something like this. If a is negative and za is positive, would we be okay? That's not good, right? Because if, if A is negative and ZA is 1, that's not a contradiction. So unfortunately, this is not a good way to handle the second constraint. It's not a bad approach you know, to try to compare it to that quantity. But we want something that's going to force this. OK, so let's try. Um, So, gone. I'm going to write what I have here. I wrote it in a slightly different way than we've been doing because I actually thought over the years I liked this approach. And the reason I like to write it like this is I'm comparing ZA with 1. And I think this is a really good way of highlighting what's going on. If A is positive, I'm adding something to 1. And then ZA could be either 0 or 1. And if A is negative, then that forces the right-hand side to be a little bit less than 1. So why would we write the first one like ZA is greater than equal to 0 plus A plus 1 delta over N? And they're like very parallel. So we could do that. Right, yes. In fact, th this is a, uh, I, I agree. And in fact, email me, we should change that for the book. I think that's a, I think that's a clearer way of writing it. And you're looking at, you know, tweaks on zero, tweaks on one. I think that's a much better way of writing it. And so now we can see, um, you know, how large could this quantity be? When is it going to force it to be strictly greater than zero? When does it give no information? If this quantity is negative, there's no information. And if it's positive, then it forces ZA to be positive. Over here, if this is positive, then ZA can be completely free. 
And if it's negative, then Za has to be zero. Okay. So this now gives us a way. So we can now say if we ever add the variable Za, which is zero, one, and these two constraints, then Za will be one uh, if A is positive, if A is greater than equal to zero, and zero otherwise. Yes? I have to read. Um, what do we, or, or is this supposed to be a minus one half? Let's check. So, we know. Um, right, then zero fails. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying I want. Let me check. Is this how I wrote it? Um, Right. right. So I want Z A right to be trying to exclude zero. Yeah. So in the top case, do plus A over N and Z A equals undefined at zero. So then if you have A exactly equal to N, like that on the bottom case you mean? In the top case, if A is exactly right. equal to N, then that quantity is just greater than one, so Z A can never be greater than something else. Right. So I think there's two ways to fix this, so this is a good point. Um yeah, no, no, there's an, there's an easy thing to do. I mean, one thing is to just do something like this. And so th this, is, this is a really good point. I, I might have actually missed this. So one thing we can do is A is less than equal to N minus delta. And then if we do something like that, then we have a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, you know, we have some bound. Make the bound a little bit bigger. Uh, good, good catch. And then we don't have to worry about what's happening at the extreme case because A is never going to be equal to N. This is why sometimes you put in a little bit of extra protection. We could make this, you know, 2n plus 1, something like that, to really push things up. Uh, question. Wait, is it n minus delta or n plus over 1? Over here? Delta I'm, I'm forcing a to be strictly less than n by at least delta. Okay. So now if I do something like that, the largest this could be would be n minus delta. Yeah. Right. So the idea is not that bad. You're, the mechanics is you just have to be a little careful. Is there a way that we can write, for example, like a more simple third constraint that ends up with like a equals one if, or sorry, z equals one if a equals zero undefined else, and then those three constraints? Um, right. Oh, I see. Um, like, this way we po po possibly. This way we throw out the one half delta, we have like zero. Right, right. Like three right. I, I would much rather have a constraint. I would much rather have two constraints than three constraints. Okay. Yes? I have a question about the first uh, equality. Do we just, uh, instead of uh, larger than or equal to, could we just like instead be larger than and then we could remove the one half delta? You could probably do something like that. So if we, so if we just did something strictly greater than, um, now, even if A is zero, then we're good. So if A is zero, it forces ZA to be one. If A is positive, it forces ZA to be one, and A is at most n. Okay, now we're good. But now if A is actually equal to n, then we would be in trouble because it would have to be greater than one. But now we've assumed over here that, right. And so you, you can see now why you want to you know, chase these things around a little bit. Okay, does it really matter? You know, when you do stuff like this, in terms of computation, uh, the large value you take for n, you might have to look at a larger space. And it could actually slow the computation down. So there could be a real incentive. Uh, how many of you have done Monte Carlo integration? So for those of you who haven't and are taking probability with me later in the semester, you will do it. Uh, one of the ways we integrate in higher dimensional spaces is we throw dots at a board. And you know, we see how many of the dots, sorry, Boston accent, dots, uh, land inside the region. And a really good estimate of the area of the region, or the hypervolume, is the fraction of dots times the volume of the big square or hyperbox. Now, in terms of how accurate things are, you probably want to choose the smallest box you can. 
You know, if I choose this box versus choosing this box, which do you think does a better job of estimating the area? The small box or the large box? The small box, right? Now, theoretically, they'll both work, but the convergence rate will be different. So when we're trying to find these universal bounds, there is a strong reason to take the smallest upper bound that would work. And so when we're trying to do these constraints, it is worthwhile playing some of these games and seeing what's the minimal thing we can take here. And then this is why I'm not taking the absolute largest value of um, n that I can do naively. I might actually spend some time trying to find a good, clean way. Okay. Any questions on this? All right, so in the interest of time, I'm going to just write down some of the next ones. So the next one is, I think, the exclusive OR. And so again, for the exclusive OR, it's A or B, but not both. And so there are seven constraints. So the first is ZA is 0, 1. The second is A over NA. And so I'm putting a subscript there. This is a universal number, but it's a universal number coming from my analysis of A. I could, of course, just use one N for both my quantity A and B. Um, I want um, ZA equal one if A or B are greater than or equal to zero, but not both. Else, I want ZA to be zero. And so just to keep things small, maybe I have one bound for the A quantity and one bound for the B quantity. I could, of course, just use the maximum of the two. But I can keep numbers a little bit small if I do it this way. So I'll do ZA A over NA plus delta over 2NA is less than or equal to ZA. And 3, I'll do ZA... Um, is less than or equal to 1 plus A over NA. For my constraint 4, I will do uh, ZB is in 0, 1. I will do for 5, B over NB plus delta over 2 N. Oh, this is definitely a typo in the book because I've got an N... A over here, that should almost surely be an NB, is less than or equal to ZB. And I think there actually might even be another typo. Uh, 6 would be ZB is less than or equal to 1 plus B over NB. And 7 is ZA plus ZB equals 1. Okay. So let's check and see if this is right, and if it's not right, let's fix it. Question? Um, yeah, why do we specify the ends for the A and B, um, but not delta? Um, I mean, we, we could also have a delta scale as well. I'm just assuming I have one natural scale for everything. We could, of course, just drop all the subscripts and just do it all with ends. Um, it, it really makes no difference. Just trying to keep some of the numbers a little bit smaller for implementation purposes, but absolutely fine to just drop it like that. So I've got, right, so let's see if this works. So the first one is, is it possible for both ZA and ZB to be one? So this constraint here is going to force at most one of them is one. Does it do more than forcing at, at most one of them? At least one of them has to be one. So let's look at what these constraints do. So ZA is 0 or 1. We now have this relation. If A is positive, what does that force ZA to be? ZA can't be 0. If A is positive, ZA has to be 1. If A is negative, then ZA is free. 
because the small, because you know, if A is negative, it'll be at least negative delta. This will be smaller than that. This whole left-hand side will be negative. So this constraint forces ZA to be 1 if A is greater than or equal to 0. And if, it's, and if A is negative, it has no impact. What about this constraint? If A is negative, it forces ZA to be 0. And if A is positive, it has no impact. So these things over here, uh, ZA is equal to 1 if A is greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Now let's look at what goes on over here. This looks like it's exactly the same constraints. So this would force ZB to be 1 if B is greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Yes? Um, are 2 and 3 a different idea than 1 and 2 over here? Or I think they're, they're, they're similar. I, I think I've just rewritten them ever so slightly. So it's the, it's the same idea. It's, it's basically coming up with a variable. And now, I'm not sure I like that equals 1. Is that a typo? All right. So now, let's look at this and see if we need to fix this. If both A and B are positive, what would happen? If both A and B are positive, what would happen? Well, let's say if both A and B are greater than or equal to 0. Constraint 7 is violated. So this will not allow us to have both A and B greater than or equal to 0. <coughs> yes? But that, that's a possibility, right? But what it would now tell us is... Right, so this would... This would force our model not to allow us to consider any situations where both A and B are positive, as opposed to having ZA be an indicator of whether or not both are positive. So this is not coding exactly what we want. So you could think of this as, I never want to be in a situation where both A and B are non-negative. And if I had something like this, if both A and B were non-negative, this constraint would be violated, and I would never consider this a feasible solution. That's harsher than we want. Right? So what we want is we just want to know that um, if A or B is greater than or equal to 0, something happens. We're trying to include for exclusive or, yes. Right, but the way this is, is set up now, uh, this would be f this would be f forcing a change on the the feasible space. It would never allow us to consider A and B. It would not be indicating that A and B are positive. Yes. Right, so what I'm saying is, I think we need, I think this is where the typo is. Maybe we want this to be Z is 1 if A or B is greater than or equal to 0, but not both. Else we want Z to be 0. That we added an extra subscript. And so now, this will give us 1 if A is greater than or equal to 0. This will give us 1 if B is greater than or equal to 0. And so now, we should be able to fix this a little bit. <coughs> Let's try and then we'll probably have to stop here. So what if I try to compare Z to ZA and ZB? We don't want both of them to happen. So if we look at 2 minus this, <coughs> so
So now, if both of these happen, this is a zero. If only one of them happens, it's a one. And if none of them happens, so this is a start. So we'll, we'll, we'll finish this. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, we, we, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop here. It's annoying to stop here. But think about how we should fix this last constraint. So over here, this would definitely give us zero if both ZA and ZB are one. And then if ZA and ZB are not both one, it's completely free. So this gives us half of what we're doing. And then maybe we could do Z is greater than or equal to, I think, ZA plus ZB over two. If one of them happens, that forces... But now, if both of them happen, we have trouble. Because that's forcing it. So we've got to think as to how we want to do that last constraint. So we'll start Friday's class with that. Okay. <laughs>